Moving on to number 10, the 2021 budget reduction scenarios. Thank you, Diana. Good evening. So um, last week, as part of the budget workshop, the finance director, Spencer Morrison, noted that we would be bringing back before you tonight uh, different options to address the projected $3.5 million shortfall for fiscal year 2021. So as a reminder, in November 2019, the City Council adopted eight priorities, which guide Council's direction on the allocation of resources. So here are the eight priorities in no particular order. With public safety, uh, the goal is to ensure the highest level of public safety. Fiscal stability to maintain and enhance the fiscal stability of the city. With the organizational culture, foster a culture of customer service, transparency, and accountability. With business friendly, convey that Yuba City is open for business. Enhance partnerships, strengthen and develop partnerships within our region. With quality of life, maintain and enhance our quality of life. Infrastructure, identify and address our infrastructure financial needs. In homeless and vagrancy, address homeless issues in our community. So here's a brief recap of what we heard last Tuesday. With the general fund revenues expected, based upon the current knowledge that we have, of $42.7 million, general fund expenditures of $46.3 million, we have a projected shortfall of $3.5 million. So the presentation tonight will focus on department reduction scenarios. So the police and fire departments uh, prepared two and a half and 5% reduction scenarios, while the non-safety departments prepared two and a half, five percent and seven and a half percent reduction scenarios. We'll also go over uh, the option to utilize other discretionary funds and then bargaining unit discussions. So here is a table that summarizes the, um, the fiscal uh, totals related to the budget reduction scenarios. Um, police and fire departments make up 38 and 25% of the general fund expenditures respectively for a total of 63%, meaning that the non-general, non-safety departments make up the remaining 37%. Um, so this table shows the dollar values associated with each reduction scenario. So for instance, if council were to direct staff to proceed with the 2.5% across all departments, the projected savings would be $1.55 million. Versus if council directed staff to proceed with a 5% for the safety departments, a 7.5% for the non-safety departments, the corresponding anticipated savings would be $2.76 million. Not to leave the enterprise fund uh, out, um, if you do the same exercise for water and wastewater, for water, the reduction re result in anywhere from $287,000 up to $862,000. For wastewater, it's a minimum of $352 up to $1,037,000. The one thing I would like to note with the water and wastewater funds is that they're different than the general fund departments in that they're swapped and that their salaries and benefits portion is a much smaller portion compared to material services and supplies. When you look at general fund departments, typically salaries and benefits is a much larger portion of the budget compared to material services and supplies. With the options related to discretionary funds, um, uh, freeze vacant positions and evaluate filling them on a case-by-case -case basis. Over the last five years, vacancies have resulted in 1.85 million in savings. And over the last 10 years, 1.33 million in savings on average. Many of the department reduction scenarios that are gonna be presented tonight assume that vacancies will remain frozen. Uh, freeze non-essential travel and restrict training. Only approve training and travel necessary for employees to maintain certifications or required training to perform their jobs. Do not contribute the 10% match to the Yuba Sutter Lodging Association. That's currently budgeted at 127,500. Hold or reduce the general fund contribution to the vehicle replacement fund and evaluate replacement of vehicles on a case-by-case -case basis. That's currently budgeted at $800,000. Draw from the pension stabilization trust. The current or the projected balance as of June 30th is $2,447,255. Lower the unallocated general fund CIP. As of June 30th, it's expected to have an unallocated remaining of 418 in addition, there's 500,000 set aside that's recommended uh, for unexpected needs. And then finally, utilize the Healthy Cities Reserve, um, including the fiscal year 1920 
projected budget shortfall of $458,400, the balance is $6,377,622. Um, it's important to note the bargaining units. As of July 1st, we have five represented bargaining units that will have open contracts. Those bargaining units include the Yuba City Firefighters Local 3793, Yuba City Fire Management, First Level Managers, Mid Managers, and Public Employees Local Number 1. There are items that could be brought before the bargaining units for consideration, such as freezing merit increases. That's not something that's done at the pa in the past because it's typically a smaller dollar amount. Just to give you an idea, the estimated value of general fund merit increases for fiscal year 2021 is $284,706. And it should be noted that um, employees that have been hired within the last couple of years, their increases are based upon 2.5% merit increases versus employees that have been here longer. It's based upon a 5% merit increase. Regardless, any reduction scenarios that impact wages, hours, and working conditions will require that the city follow the meet and confer requirements to discuss impacts. In regard to implementation, um, there are still many unknowns related to COVID-19. And so the projections are based upon the best available information that we have. However, it's expected that we will have better sales tax information in the late August, early September timeframe. So with that, um, the finance director, it's recommended the finance director come back and provide you quarterly updates as to the budget and the revenue projections and expenditure projections. And staff recommends that council adopt an approach of implement, monitor, and reassess. So utilize a combination of discretionary funds and reduction of department um, budgets with the goal of not cutting too much too soon or cutting too little too late. And with that, we would recommend that the finance director bring forward an update in the um, September timeframe for the previous three months. We evaluate at that point in time, determine if additional reductions are required and reassess and continue that process over the upcoming fiscal year. So as of now, I would like to invite um, Chief Landon up to discuss the police department reduction scenarios. Mayor, we received a public comment. Do you want to now? <coughs> a question? Yes, go ahead. Okay. All right. Um, and this probably is going to be more for Diana. <laughs> That's why he's trying to get it in. Um, the question is from Gary Stuckey, and he wants to know why is water and wastewater not seen as a public safety function? In terms of how we have traditionally classified departments, police and fire are considered safety departments. Um, the other departments are considered non-safety and that's the nomenclature that we've used to reference them. In terms of water and wastewater as consumers, that is considered a health and safety issue, um, but it's really how we define departments. And Natalie probably has a better response to that in terms of the official bargaining unit and that type of description, but that's the difference. All right, thank you. Chief. Good evening, Mayor, Council Members. So I apologize if I'm a little passionate. When I was first appointed as a police chief, they said I was supposed to be the advocate and protect and serve. So that are, that's, that's my role, I take it seriously. And we're talking about budgets and cuts with everything going on in this community right now. I just want to be uh, very upfront and let you know that I am passionate. I hope it doesn't come across any other way. So I wanted to go to a number, but I don't know how to backslide it. So I'm just going to tell you guys that the number that was pointed out there earlier said that um, our budget was 38% for the police department of the general fund. And I know Spencer presented something earlier to you guys in the week that showed that the actual average police departments were 45 so I want to point that out just to let you know on a $15 million budget, which is what we have, you can do the math and figure out it's a little over a million dollars that we are currently underfunded. I won't say underfunded, I will just say different than the average. So the Yuba City PD was asked to present two different scenarios, two and a half and five percent. The reduction from the police department budget of $15,507,875 equates to $387,697 and 775,394 for a 5% budget reduction. 
And just to start it off with a statement, I just want to quote something that was, um, we've gone through this before in 2010, 2011, one of the, everybody has in, in this area. Stockton had a lot of debate going back and forth, and one of the statements that was put in their paper was from one, uh, an advocate of law enforcement. And he basically said, social issues and economics drive crime down more than the number of police officers. However, the more cops you have available, the more ability you have to drive crime down. Common sense, countless studies, and obvious reality dictate this fact. But what is really at stake here is the level of service we can live with as we go through reductions. Cut police positions and it will affect dramatically a variety of things that we, can, we have come to expect. Things like response times to calls, less time and ability to properly investigate crimes, less crimes investigated, less accidents investigated, less ability to arrest offenders, and less ability to respond to critical incidents, and so much more. As far as will crimes go up, Maybe not immediately, maybe not at all. So I guess it all comes down to what is the quality of life that we're willing to uh, live with. The, live, the impact of losing an officer at the Yuba City Police Department equates to about 2.8% of our patrol staff. Historically, I wanna go back to 2008, 2009 to show why we are going to personnel cuts and why we're going to officer, I'm not saying we're going to the cuts, but that's why we have to explore from that aspect was in 2010, 2011, we were staffed at 103.5 positions full-time for the police department. Two years later, when we did the budget reduction in 2010, 2011, and that was 91 and a half, or 2010, 2011, we went from 103.5 to 91.5 full-time positions. So a reduction of 12. We went from 68 sworn officers down to 65. We lost three dispatchers and four community officers, service officers, in the recent proposed budget, we're allotted 96.5 positions if we maintain the status quo of what we have right now and we hire the positions that are currently frozen. Out of those, 67 are sworn. So in that 10-year period, we went from 68 sworn officers down to 65, and now we're at 67 as our population increased throughout that 10-year period. So we're still at a 6.8% staff reduction from 2010, 2011. So we're really thin in most areas of the department and we're not able to make cuts from our support staff because that's something that never got staffed back up in order for us to re reach those numbers. I know a question was brought up today is, um, it looks like the police department is the only department that is increasing their budget. I may be misspeaking here, but increasing our budget based on the currently projected budget coming forward. And I'll tell you right now, we're not asking for more stuff. That's coming from pay raises. So it, it does look like we are going up. It's not like that we are asking for any more MS and F and no additional staffing. When we're talking about the other areas about MS and S, we just don't have the ability to do that. And I'll get down to that a little bit here. And our city vehicle replacement fund I know we're already currently talking about motorcycles. And out of our current motorcycles, um, we are currently looking to go through the lease. We've already had those vehicles for approximately four years in February 2021, which means we've extended them for a year beyond their extended life or beyond their shelf life already. And as we look at that budget, there's no money in that replacement fund for them. There is zero dollars in that replacement fund. I think it's a negative balance, if I'm not mistaken. So. We can't take money out of the vehicle replacement fund because of the law enforcement department. We replace our vehicles and they're not always fully funded. We don't have control of that budget. Um, and it's basically a city thing, citywide function that is over time and for historically, we have not funded it to the proper levels. And we're filling that right now. We're not able to do that in our department. We currently have four 2016 patrol vehicles that we extended for one year in order to obtain a higher balance in their replacement fund. Um, we like to replace our vehicles at 100,000 miles. I think all law enforcement agencies do because they're driven daily, sometimes two shifts. We rotate them around, but it's not enough for every officer to have a vehicle. So we've extended four of our vehicles this year that we did not ask for, and they are past their life as far as time, but they do have some mileage left on them. Another fact is currently the Yuba City Police Department does not provide law enforcement services to the Walton Annexation Area, a population of approximately 11,000 citizens. In order to meet the demands of the additional area and population, the Yuba City PD would have to add an additional six patrol officers, one community service officer, and one dispatcher. It's been since 2000 since we've um, provided service to that area, and it's our number one phone call that we take 
about why we aren't providing levels of, or the our same level of service to that area as the rest of our city. And I will say Sutter County Sheriff's Department does an excellent job and CHP does an excellent job of that area, but they don't have the same level of um, officers in, a, in an area. They don't have the, the same level of code enforcement or code community service officers as well. So those are all things I just wanted to give historically. If we cut police officers, and that's what we're looking at doing, the first impact will be in ancillary, ancillary positions. This is our 2.5% scenario. It's $407,750. It's a little bit above what we would ask for currently, and we can get this way through freezing positions. So we're at, we have two open community service officers right now. We have one open officer position right now. We have three dispatcher positions that are open, but there is no way in the world that we can hold those open and, and provide a quality service to this city. We would not be able to answer 911 calls in a timely fashion. And then we have another officer that we just recently hired. So when we look about letting him potentially uh, finish the academy and exploring that option, trying to be creative, let him finish till January as we reevaluate our uh, budget over time, we have to make a decision. Do we bring him back or do we allow him to test somewhere else or go to another agency? So if we cut police officers, the first impact's gonna be in ancillary positions, a combination of traffic officers, detectives, gang officers, and or our homeless liaison officer will be moved to patrol because the police department's number one function is to answer 911 calls. That's what we are tasked with doing, that's what we need to do. We'll have less resources to handle transient issues, homeless issues. If we take the officer out of traffic, cuts will be a uh, lead to less enforcement, longer response time to traffic accidents, and potentially an increase in traffic accidents because we have four traffic officers. So you can kind of do the math and figure out each one's gonna reduce it about 25% if we just had traffic officers doing enforcement. So we, we would look at, uh, like, the um, like I just explained. Officers, just another factor, is officers take over one year to recruit to pass a background, to pass psychological testing, to pass medical evaluation, to complete police academy and pass a four month field training program. For every officer position we do not fill, we must wait a full year in order to completely fill that position. And I say that because that's what we've experienced in the past. I think right now, being down one position is the best we have been since we did the original budget reductions. Current, um, if we, the. CSO positions, community service officers, there are non-sworn officers who respond to recalls with no suspects. They can do traffic accidents, they can do parking enforcement, they can do a majority of other things that an officer does not have to handle. When you lose a community service officer, what happens is now the officers that are on that shift are forced to take those calls, which amounts to less proactive time for them to be doing other things because now they're forced to do the cold calls. So that's basically the 2.5% uh, reduction is by meeting it through that standards. Now, I'll stop for questions right now if anybody has any questions about our 2.5% scenario. Okay. I think we're good, Chief. And that equates to a $407,000 budget savings. Sorry, go ahead. Through the mayor. Um, Chief, so yes. the community service officers, you're, we have two openings that are... You're, you're in this scenario freezing, but we still have the two other officers. No, in this scenario that I'm proposing right now, we will have to um, freeze the two CSO positions. One of them just became open. The other one is fairly open, recently opened because we had an officer go from CSO to officer, and okay. he's currently attending the academy. We will still have to freeze an officer position for a year, and we would still freeze one dispatch position for six months. We have a current promotional position open for a dispatch three, which is a supervisor, we would hold that open for six months as well, not promote until January. And then we would allow the officer number two, who we just hired to finish the academy, re-explore that as we come forward in the, looking at the budget. Okay, so, it's, so we still have the community service officer, but there's really one position, person transferred. So you're saying both would be freezed at this point in, in this scenario? In this scenario, two would be, we do have two other CSOs currently on the road. Okay, so it would be 50% of our patrol staff. Okay, 50, okay. Is that correct, yeah. Brian? Okay. Is that, okay. That's what I was needing clarification. Okay. Thank Absolutely. You. So uh, as we get to 
I'll just say that's pretty draconian for us in the police department because, again, we'd have to go to police officers' positions and able to uh, attain that. So we'd have to pick three more sworn officer positions, and we'd lose those officers, which would put us down a total of five officers if we count the first two that we would have given up. So what I did ask is I wanted our staff to put some stuff together too because I know I miss a lot of things in the course of my going through this staff report. And I wanted them to also give me the impacts of cuts because one of the council members had asked for what are the direct impacts. So in addition to what I've already pointed out, what does a loss of community service officers do? Um, and I don't want to be repetitive, so I may have covered a lot of this, but currently they spend about 30% of their time on parking issues. That would be lost. 15 to 25 percent of the CSO time is spent on serving subpoenas, which is a very necessary but very mundane, and an officer doing that function really takes him away from his uh, ability to be a patrol officer. But that has to be done, and we have to do it as a police department. So that'll be picked up by patrol officers, further reducing their availability. Truck off-road parking. Um, become a lower priority and will lessen the quality of life issues as we will no longer have those positions to do that. CSOs allow officers to handle issues with suspects and to contact homeless, et cetera. This time will also be impacted. Dispatcher's loss, I, I really don't even want to get into the dispatcher loss because as uh, Vice Mayor Boomgarden knows, it doesn't just provide service for the police department, it's the fire department, it's after hours, um, all kinds of stuff. We can't afford there. We just can't hire enough dispatchers right now, and nobody can in the state. So we're, we're doing the best we can. We have two candidates right now, and hopefully they go through training soon. Officer losses. The two uh, loss positions would have to come from a, a combination of these, either traffic, homeless, homeless liaison officer, or gang enforcement officer. The traffic officer, I already explained what happens when we lose that. The homeless liaison officer is very important to us, uh, incorporates so many different facets. We just signed the new HART MOU that allows us to participate with the other agencies to get some type of a con conglomeration and just an exponential amount of uh, people on the streets by consolidating with the other departments. We would no longer be able to do that. And with the gang officer, we have seen an uptick right now in gang activity in the regional area. And I think that is something that we've been monitoring very carefully. We just did a big, pro, um, a very big sweep this past week where we had 32 officers from the multi-jurisdictional areas go out and start serving probation uh, searches and other things. But we would lose a gang officer. And when we do those YSH type operations like those sweeps, we lose the intelligence that we normally would have in order to do an effective sweep of gang members. And again, on the second scenario, then we're basically picking what are we pulling out of because we've already picked the first two. The homeless liaison officer would obviously be gone at that point, traffic officer or gang officer, and then we're gonna to have to look at the other ancillary positions. I, I just feel right, right, right now in this climate as I'm looking out and seeing what's happening in our community, communities all across the, um, the United States, we're watching it every day on, on the news, is that we need the public trust. And I think that that's been very important at the police department as we've gone through all our different scenarios. Our number one target has always been community-based policing. As you reduce officers, you, allow, you reduce the ability to get out there and make those contacts. You reduce the ability to have that one-on-one -on -one relationship, the ability to go into the schools and talk to the kids and uh, just be a part of their life that helps us when scenarios are out here, when people are protesting, when scenarios are out there, when you can just go up and talk to a group of people because you know them through your different... Um, community service. So in conclusion, the PD's never fully recovered st structurally from the 2010-11 budget. Current staffing is 7% below that price to the, prior to the reductions. We don't have the maneuverability to cut from MS&S. The cost of professional services, outside cost, testing and training is significantly increased. We just recently, the state keeps mandating more, traf more training to us. Our officers just received racially biased, biased training, um, implicit bias training, which was very timely with everything that's going on right now. But our ms and S every year, it's not in our control what training is assigned to the police department. We don't have the ability to say, yes, we're going to take it. No, we're not going to take it. Uh, the state's going to pay for it because the state's not going to pay for it. We're going to have to figure out how to do that. The state has also come up with a new uh, mandate on how we track contacts with citizens. 
So we've kind of got ahead of the curve and getting some equipment right now through our COPS grant that'll help us. And what I'm talking about is every time we contact a person out in the field, we have to write down or we have to document nationality, age, there's how many criteria? 30 something different criteria an officer has to do on every stop that they make. And if you can imagine on a fast, if you're just doing a finger check or a, there's, there's other agencies that are doing it now on a trial basis and they're taking a 10, 15 minutes or sometimes even longer with every single contact. So our officers are gonna make it less contacts just because of the state mandates. It's, it's one of the things that we are doing and I think it's a good thing to do that, but I think it's a very, uh, it's, it's hard for the city to absorb that type of training and not be reimbursed for the costs. But it is important because it reduces racial profiling and we do track our data after that. We're able to put it in, we're required to put it in to a, a database that the state will track. New, new mandates also, de-escalation of force, the use of force, changing the criteria for use of force are now being instituted to all agencies in California. That's also important but it also comes at a cost. So we can't touch our MSNS budget, and on a normal year, we'd be asking for more, but we're trying to figure out creative ways not to do that by training instructors, by doing the training at the police department, having our, uh, we, we've gone out in a bunch of new ventures, and had it not been for Zoom and the COVID, we'd probably be exploring them a little bit more. Those losses will be impactful and reduce the quality of life and the ability to respond to emergencies at the same level as we currently provide, because we are gonna be tracking all these people on every stop. So bottom line, we're all part of the same city. We all wanna make the reductions. We wanna do what we can to help. But I just don't think that I'd be a good advocate if I didn't tell you everything that is, we're faced with each decision that we make and how important it is to make the decisions going forward. Do you have some? Yeah, go ahead. Through the mayor, chief, thank you. Um, I've known you, I'm a man of great passion for your department for the years that, that uh, we worked alongside each other and I, I definitely hear it <clears throat> and I know your staff feels the same way. There's just a few things I wanna click down. I agreed with most of what you said. Um, I do wanna address the, uh, the Walton area issue. Um, what mi might be unbeknownst is that there is a current effort right now, uh, Councilman Shaw and myself uh, have been appointed by the rest of the council to deal with the master tax exchange agreement. Um, you can rest assured that the topic of, of protecting in the Walton area is, is top of mind. And uh, the folks that, um, and Ben Moody and Diane are also on that committee, you know, our consultants are leading us to believe, and I trust them, that there may be some light at the end of the tunnel as long as we can get together with the county and get this agreement uh, for the Bogue Stewart done and then move it up towards the area that it's impacting, uh, had impacted the Walton area. I don't hear myself, and this is where I slightly just, I don't hear a lot of pleas from the Walton area for us to be down there. I'm cognizant of the fact that those do exist, so I'm not challenging that. Um, but as I'm making decisions up here today in this extreme situation that COVID-19 has brought to us, um, it's not necessarily one of my higher priorities to extend your services beyond that, which you can already um, provide service for. Um, there are some alternatives, and right now I, we're there. I do. I do want to talk about the vehicle replacement fund and I want to thank you for your phone call this morning to address my questions in that regard. Um, I had an experience as a young department head when I was basically told that I shouldn't pay attention to the vehicle replacement fund. It had nothing to do with my department. And uh, frankly, um, and that's not anybody that's in this room or on staff right now, but that, uh, that um, basically was a slap in the face because it absolutely had everything to do with my department. It had how I funded my fire engines. And I know that's how it's funding your, your police vehicles. I think the vehicle replacement fund for many years has been sort of a, a place to hide money or go get money. And it hasn't been fully funded and it hasn't been uh, administered fairly to the departments, um, in my opinion. And that's just one person's opinion. Uh, as we move forward, I think uh, this council should consider uh, taking a look at that fund. It's extremely important that, uh, especially for our public safety uh, departments, that those vehicles that our officers and firefighters respond in uh, are safe and that we can provide uh, the kinds of vehicles and, and, and types of vehicles that they need to provide their service. 
So as it relates to the motorcycles, you know, I'm looking for creative ways to fund that. By no means am I suggesting that we don't. I just think that those are vehicles. Those should come from the vehicle replacement fund, and the five people that are sitting up here on the dais need to figure out how to how to make the vehicle replacement fund do what it's supposed to do on a go-forward basis. Um, I raised the question of, of the optics of the police department budget being uh, looking at it as the only department that's increased. And again, I'm going to speak on behalf of myself. One of the reasons that that is the case, and you mentioned it, was because of salaries that were negotiated on behalf of our police officers. And why did we do that? Because we want to recruit and we want to retain. And if we don't do that, then we're going to be a constant revolving door. We're going to have people leaving the organization and going someplace else. So when people look at why is the police department, why are they, why are they being held you know, up uh, against other departments, you only need to look up here. We agreed to the contracts, and the reason we did was because we want to make sure that we have an adequate police force and that those that we recruit stay with us and that if we do have vacancies due to attrition or retirements, that we can attract the kind of people that provide service to the city of Yuba City in the form or fashion that, that we want. As far as the dispatchers, I want to add one other thing. Um, uh, dispatchers do emergency medical dispatching. And so it's not just taking the 911 call, passing that on to fire and, and whatever. Uh, there are instances, and I don't know the numbers anymore, I'm sure your staff could provide those, but they are the first line um, of perhaps helping somebody who's in great distress in regards to saving their lives. And we've had experiences with that in the city of Yuba City. So when you start talking about uh, dispatchers, you, you need to know that a portion of their, of their uh, responsibilities and role is to take that call, process it, and in some cases, tell someone on the other end of the line how to save somebody's life. And uh, I don't know that you can put a value on that, frankly. Um, we are in a tough spot uh, as a city council and you know, throughout all the discussions, and I'm not going to get deep into it, we are in a tough spot of, of having to deal with uh, what COVID-19 has, has done to the city as far as its sales tax revenue. And um, I, for me, public safety is police and fire. Uh, and for me, police and fire is something that we need to work very hard to try to, to maintain staffing and the service levels were provided. Um, back 2008, 2009 is when, uh, when it really got a bit serious and I don't know that we've ever recovered and this is gonna throw another curveball at us, but uh, I, I think uh, speaking again as one person is that uh, our public safety agencies, we need to try to hold them um, and, and allow them to provide the service at a level that we, that we feel our citizens deserve. And with that, Mayor, I'll conclude my comments. Thank you, Vice Mayor. Thank you, sir, ma'am. Thank you, Mayor. I just want to add um, maybe a different view, Vice Mayor Boomgarden, on the Walton annexation, um, because I am often asked why isn't police, Yuba City Police, responding to calls there? Um, not necessarily to say that um, the other two law enforcements that you mentioned aren't doing an adequate or um, a good job. It's just um, a question that often comes up in conversations because um, the idea was that the annexation part of it, that was an agreement years ago that some at some point uh, the city would take over that particular um, part of our community. And at this moment, um, it's still, um, it, it, it's patrolled by other other um, law enforcement, but it's part of our city. And, and many people that live there um, are uh, not always pleased with the service that they get from the outside uh, law enforcement. So I would be interested in knowing if there could be further discussion on that in the master tax agreement, as you mentioned. Um, I am concerned, though, that you mentioned, um, Chief, the idea that if we were to, you know, any of those scenarios, in particular the second scenario where you're talking about the reduction of 5% where law, you know, five officers, and you're speaking of, um, you know, homeless and gangs, uh, I'm also curious to know with the school resource officers, would that be in that conversation of those number of five or is that separate because there's a contract and some other obligations already there? 
So to answer your, your question on school resource officers, yes, there is a um, obligation. And to be honest with you, they provide so much of a service down there, even if their contract wasn't covered. 50% 50 of, of their salary, and I think 15% of the vehicle for that particular vehicle are covered by this school. Right. So yeah, we, we get a good bang for our buck and we have a good relationship with the kids in the school as a result of the right. school resource officers. Well, I would be really disheartened if that was a cut, but I'm glad to hear that you're not considering that out of the five. But the homeless um, position that we have with um, Officer Troy that he's been doing the work with a heart has been um, a, a strong impact, a positive impact with the homeless community, which is part of that quality of life which in long term um, would be uh, uh, an improvement of savings um, because when we're dealing with um, homeless community members in different parts of our community, it costs quite a bit of money to then, if, if we don't have those resources or that partnership. Um, my question is, um, oh, no, I appreciate, let me rephrase that. I appreciate your advocacy and your passion to this and the historical view, uh, because I was not here in 2008 and 9, um, the reductions, in particular, I'm interested to know your thoughts about the vehicle replacement fund, because prior to elect elected and thereafter elected, um, there, it, that fund seems to be kind of the fund that was always discussed uh, of a nature where um, why, why, why don't executive directors have more access to it or can, or um, uh, some sort of um, decision opportunities about it? So you brought it up. What do you want to do with that fund if you had access to it? Fully fund it, pay for all the vehicles that we want. That was a big question, right? And I just let it go all the way through. What would you do if you, could you pay for the motorcycles out of that fund? Would you be willing to begin in that process of I'm not sure if you're saying we, because right now, since it's not fully funded, right. in any money we take out of that, we're losing a different vehicle. We're taking money out of a pot of a vehicle that isn't fully funded as well. Right. So I'm not sure. I guess the question is more towards the motorcycles. Pay for it out of the vehicle fund, not out of the general fund. I think at this point, I, that's not a question for me because I don't control the vehicle replacement fund. I'm asking you, fund. what would your opinion be if you had the opportunity to help with that decision? To as help. you do. So you're asking me, would I take it out of the general fund or would I take it out of the vehicle replacement exactly. fund? I don't know enough about the vehicle replacement fund and what the current status is of it. I don't know where you find $125,000. That's a preferable way to take it out of the vehicle replacement fund because that's where it should come from because it's a vehicle replacement. Mm -hmm. But I don't know how... You answered my question. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Through the mayor. Sir. If I may, sir, unless you had a comment. Nope. Okay. Chief, uh, thanks for being here tonight. Um, just a couple of, of questions going back. I mean, first of all, I, I think all of our safety uh, agencies, fire and police, know how I feel about safety first in this community. And, um, I go back to what you said as far as the uh, positions. I think all safety has been under positioned for quite a while. And it's one of the reasons I ran for this office. We had that discussion where I was uh, told by others that no, you guys had more than enough. But at the same time, all we had to do is take a look around and know that uh, neither department was staffed to the levels that it needed to be when you start looking at ratios. Um, so to both departments, thank you. Because I know you guys have worked through a lot of hell to do what you do for this city uh, with one arm tied behind your back. So I'll start by saying thank you to both departments right front because, uh, Chief, you're next, I know. Um, but going back to the Walton, um, I'm wondering if we have a comparison cost because you brought up the Walton area. Um, I echo the vice mayor's comments. Uh, don't hear it that often, but you do hear people say about when is the service going to be kept? It's more about a promise that was implied about 20 years ago is really what it boils down to because I've seen in my year and a half on the council that uh, if anything happens that is uh, needed to be addressed in the Walton area, you guys are there. I remember an incident down at the school 
that uh, you guys were right there with the uh, Sutter County Sheriff. That was, a, I think it was last summer, but you guys were right there. And uh, so I don't think there's a service degradation. I think it gets more back to broken promises from a long time ago, and I think that's where that stems from. But going back to the master tax exchange agreement, uh, there's a cost associated with it. We've ran the numbers, and if we had to stand up those number of officers um, and get everything affiliated with it, I believe we were talking somewhere around a million dollars is what, two million, three million? Well, the initial stand-up cost for buying the vehicles and everything else was at one time 1 1.2 to 1.4 million. That was okay. a couple of years ago. Okay, it's significant is kind of what I'm trying to get to. And in that, there's a cost right now with the uh, master tax exchange agreement for the Walton area that's nowhere near that that they're taking out. And that has to do with a lot of things the vice mayor uh, talked about that we've been trying to negotiate with Sutter County. And my hope and desire is with the financial impacts that COVID has done, Sutter County will go ahead and, and get together and and let's get this done because we can not only address the uh, the current um, Stewart Road uh, annexation and that Master Shacks tax exchange agreement, but there's carryover. We can look and find some stuff in Walton. And uh, uh, unfortunately, we're really setting at a standpoint waiting on them. So I'm hoping at some future we can look forward for that. Um, but it's not because we don't want to take care of the Walton area. We do the best we can now. And I want to say thank you for what you guys do already. The um, couple of questions I had, going back to um, what I heard happened back in 08 and, and thereafter, um, everything was top down with cuts and directives. And um, my feeling is we're all in this ship together. So I know that you as chief and your department heads, of you, you guys have all worked together figuring this out, but if we had any feedback from the POA, the Sergeants Association, uh, I'm sure they're aware of this because it's been no secret after we had our uh, budget meeting last week, they were three and a half million dollars upside down. What input have they had to you in this? Because it's gonna take us all to figure out the solutions. Have they offered anything to this point? So getting back to your first um, thing on the cut, it wasn't top down. It was a totally cooperative effort. So this time we don't have the ability to go in there. It's not like we can cut 5,000 here, 5,000 here. We don't have the ability. The only way that the police department can make the cuts is through personnel. Yeah, they've been talked to, and yes, we've um, got input from them, but we don't have a lot of leeway as where we can pull the money from. So, Right. I was just looking to see if they may have had any ideas themselves um, on where there might be savings. None to this point, just hopefully save the ship. Well, this is the first step right here to figure <laughs> this out, and we'll go back afterwards and okay. explore where we would take the positions. Okay, and then just the other sentiment, uh, and I realize that vehicle replacement funds have not been fully funded over the years, and that's where we get into the deficits for all the different departments across the board. I think that uh, this council is going to have to take it under... Um, our council and figure out how to rebalance that. And uh, because I totally agree, um, not against the PD having motorcycles. I think they're a good asset, but I do strongly uh, struggle with 125,000 coming out of the general fund. If it comes out of vehicle replacement, it may be a trade off or something down the line, but I think that's where it honestly has to come from. And I think we're gonna have to get creative up here to figure it out. But um, but to my opinion, it, it cannot come out of the general fund when we're faced with a three and a half million. Doesn't matter how much I'm for it, I just can't go there. It's got to come out of vehicle replacement. So, but again, thank you for everything you guys do. All right. Well, thank you very much, Chief. Really appreciate it. Well, uh, here before good, the chief uh, leaves, presentation. We have I appreciate comment. all the information you provided, and it definitely uh, made a good case for the importance of public safety and police department. We're looking forward to hearing from the fire chief as well. Did you have a public comment? There are two public comments for the chief. Um, one is from David Collender, and his comment was reduction to schedule salary increase. And then the other one is from Tony Curlin, and he's just wondering why the Walton area will take a back seat to the Bogue-Stewart area, which won't be built out for years, 
while the Walton area is built out and needs better policing. Do you have a comment on that one? Go ahead. I can probably respond to Mr. Curlin's, uh, what I'm assuming he's asking, which is why, why is Boke Stewart's master tax exchange agreement occurring ahead of the uh, Walton tax exchange agreement, the existing one, is uh, that's been our position that we wanna get the Bogue Stewart master plan moving and that the master tax exchange agreement associated with that is, uh, is a priority and that we can use the information gathered from that exercise and that agreement to overlay it on the existing agreement. Um, and we think that that will benefit Sutter County and Yuba City as well. Um, Mr. Curlin, you're more than welcome to give me a call or an email if you'd like further information on that, but that's the reason that Boke Stewart Master Plan and Master Tax Exchange Agreement is sitting in the forefront right now. Those are the, that's the, all the comments, sir? Okay. Grace, did you have something? Thanks, through the mayor. I, I just had a question. Um, at any given time, and I don't want to get too um, into the weeds on this, um, uh, Walton annexation. Have um, in recent times, let's say in the last five years, Chief or um, Diana, has there been a, re a survey to ask the community in that area if they're interested to being annexed and served? Well, served by our police department. Has anything been done in recently? Not that I'm aware of, but more importantly, the master tax exchange agreement has a trigger as to when we could annex that area, and we don't currently meet that um, population number. So regardless of whether or not they were interested, it's it's based upon the current stipulations in the master tax exchange agreement. So there's a population number trigger to cause for that? Right, and that's why in the past the city has proceeded with trying to annex that um, area along Highway 99, south of Franklin, between Franklin and Bogue, because if that were annexed, that would then trigger the city's ability to provide services to the Walton area. That that piece of information is very helpful. I think that the community, community knowing that, that would help um, bring more clarity to why that decision hasn't been made. And so... Um, I was not clear of that. I, I just learned that um, with the rest of us. So um, thank you for, um, I'm glad I asked the question then. It's 82% is the number. 82% of what? Yeah, of the population in that area has to be incorporated or, do you know, yeah. Right. From, in the areas like Franklin to Lincoln between North Township and uh, okay. High Freeway. Highway I'll, I'll We'll talk more about this. I can learn exactly the, the figure. Thank you. So one thing I want to point out before I step down is that even though we haven't had increases, um, that our number is down, that you guys did approve two officer positions in the last budget. So I know that this council takes public safety uh, serious, and I know that they, they're looking after it and appreciate it very much. Thank you, Chief. Chief. Good evening, Mayor, Council Members. So I was also asked to put together a 25 and 5% reduction plan for the fire department. So I'll start off by saying uh, the fire department is in a year and a half into a three-year SAFER grant. And one of those requirements of the SAFER grant is to maintain 51 line firefighters at, during the entire length of the grant. So going through that, that is one of the items that has to be maintained due to the grant is those 51. So trying to analyze the budget and to see where to come up with these specific numbers, there's the other options to look at were the prevention department. Uh, with state mandates from the ghost ship fire, uh, analyzing the prevention department with one fire marshal and one current inspector, uh, and due to the possibility of wanting to make sure that we're being very business friendly, making sure, sure that we're getting our plan reviews turned over in a timely fashion so that we're able to keep business going. Uh, and this time you don't see any reduction in the prevention department. 
very similar to the police department, uh, trying to analyze the, the budgets over the years. Uh, we does not appear that we really recovered too much in our MS and S from the 2008 hits in those categories. So had to get a little creative in, in that regards. I do have some concerns about addressing the MS and S component of it due to some of the liability components just inherently in the fire service, whether it's the specifically the turnouts that firefighters wear to the, the hose, thinking along the lines of fire uh, police officers in regards to the guns, the protect, uh, protective gear, things along those lines. So we had to get very creative, uh, not a lot of uh, flexibility there due to us not really recovering in that category. So the, the next item was to look at the administrative component. So tonight you had Mr. Fuller relieving, uh, leaving, who was an admin three analyst. However, for those who have worked with Mr. Fuller, he, he definitely performed the work of an assistant administrative chief. And to be quite honest, he was performing the work of, of two individuals in the way he conducted himself. So that was the area that we're trying to focus on in regards to this uh, 2.5 and 5% budget reduction plans. So freezing Mr. Fuller's position uh, is the item that we started off with to start securing that. We currently have also a vacant assistant chief position that's being currently infilled with an interim um, battalion chief at that level. Ideally, what we'd like to do is move that down and underfill that with a division chief uh, position versus the assistant chief uh, and tailor those positions, those duties associated to that division chief uh, component. But those were some pretty big numbers in trying to get to. So uh, that two and a half percent, that's just under 250,000 for the fire department. So try to get a little creative here and analyze some of the, uh, the alternative budgets that we have. And one of the items in our vehicle replacement fund was our water tender. Uh, analyzing to see when that was coming up. Uh, it still has four-year life expectancy on it, but then really kind of diving down into the numbers to see how often our water tender is dispatched, the mileage, hours, and the type of funds that are in there. We were able to determine that we were able to get an extended life on that due to limited uh, wear and tear on it this time and uh, the limited call volume that it takes. So that's the, the primary goal that we were able to work with to get to the two and a half percent to get to that number is looking at the vehicle replacement fund. And the 5% model, we're just under 500,000 there. And so we're still using some of the similar options to work through that more of the administrative capacity and then also uh, taking more from that vehicle replacement fund for that specific vehicle. We did have to pull over a, a little bit from a, a type six, but due to a replacement of an engine in there, we were able to extend the life uh, an additional years on that also. Concerns in regards to affecting the administrative component of the fire service is each one of those positions, whether it was Mr. Fuller working in the capacity of the administrative assistant chief or the current assistant chief vacancy that's in place. There's certain things that need and are very desirable to assist with the line staff in going forward. Uh, what I would expect council um, to want for me Going forward is I would expect you guys want me to be prepared coming out and have an emergency operations plan, strategic planning, those type of items that are out there. Um, right now, due to the assistant chief position vacancy, um, we, don't, we do not have a strategic plan in place for the department, nor an entire emergency operations plan. We do have a slow rise flood plan. Uh, in regards to some of those items that I'm also concerned in the administrative capacity in our department is how we've analyzed and looked at our facilities. We have two facilities currently that are in uh, serious need of repair, uh, station one and station two, and we also have two apparatus that are in serious uh, need of replacement. That would be our ladder truck and our engine one. And so having a administrative capacity to be analyzing, working on those type of materials uh, is very beneficial. And so that is, that is concern of myself of losing that capacity in those regards. But then I also look at the, the picture of supporting the line staff of going out. There are certain things that need to occur in regards to training of them, mandated training. Uh, analyzing of where we've been with that, there are some deficiencies coming in and noticing 
Uh, today, as an example, we were working very hard to adapt the CICCS system, which is the California Incident Command Certification System, so that the line staff is able to go out and participate in mutual aid incidents that will help recoup some of those costs uh, going out in those administrative funds that uh, when they go on deployments. So there is the need in the administrative component, but to make sure that we're providing the best service that we possibly can, that line staff of 51 will remain in place in both scenarios. And any questions? Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, Chief, uh, first and foremost, uh, welcome to Yuba City and all that you've had to deal with in the last six months now, including COVID-19. I think the only comment I have is maybe you could expand a little bit because this is of concern to me. I know it's been raised as concern from other council members is um, with Mr. Fuller's departure and uh, you know the, the lack of, of uh, staff directly reporting to you, how's that going to affect the city's ability to continue to, to develop and monitor and in, in some cases upgrade our emergency response plans beyond that which just the fire department is involved with, but all the uh, multi-hazard emergency plans that, that are uh, important for us to have, if you will, on the shelf in case something happens in our community. Great question. Uh, an example of that is you just never know when those type of emergencies are, are going to occur. God forbid something happens with an active shooter. That was one of the very first questions coming in, was asking that question, what is our plan in place for an active shooter situation? Due to that lack of administrative capacity there, there has been no policies and procedures developed for an active shooter protocols, and that's an area of concernment. So there's a lot of different categories that the fire service takes on, from hazardous materials to technical rescue. Developing those policies and procedures so that we are able to train and mitigate those issues is a, a prime concern to me uh, coming in this in the administrative capacity. Uh, but looking at emergency operations planning, being able to project out in the future to have that capacity and development for those unforeseen emergencies is, is key because you want to be able to support that line staff going out, giving them the knowledge capabilities and knowing that the leadership is ready to go with those contingency plans at all time. And so yes, that's a very big concern. I think the, the other thing, and this is more for the, uh, the council members, is you know, our fire department um, relies a lot on mutual aid, especially in this area, because none of the departments here are uh, strongly staffed. And uh, you know, I, I think everybody's aware of, even within Sutter County, some of the staffing issues they have. Um, we rely heavily on, on mutual aid um, automatic aid, which is not having to ask for help, it's just coming. The ability to have, you know, some depth um, behind the fire chief's position is, is important. And while Mr. Fuller was a fabulous administrative chief, I think the fire department has been without an operations chief essentially since I left back in 2009. Um, and, you know, to me, uh, this is a high area of, of concern, um, you know, Jesse Alexander is a wonderful guy, but there's only so much to Jesse Alexander. Um, and when he's not available for family or vacation or training or what have you, then uh, no disrespect to the others in the department, they pick it up, but we just don't have that depth of resource in the fire department. We could rattle off numbers about how we were staffed in 2007, 2008, it was a lot different than you are now, you're a lot less staffed. So again, when we start talking about cutting Staff, I think your uh, your suggestions on some of the administrative positions are spot on. But I, as it relates to supporting uh, emergency operations, we got to be very careful here. Um, we are the big fish in the pond, and folks come to rely on us. And not that we have that obligation, but we are community minded as well. But uh, we also need to have enough resources within our city to handle our issues. Uh, and and it's not like we're twenty thousand anymore. We're 67, 68,000, and your call volume has skyrocketed um, it, it, from the time I left. So I don't want to sound totally like your advocate, but uh, at the same time, I do understand what's going on and uh, appreciate the, uh, the uh, reduction scenarios. I would just hope that, uh, that when it comes to emergency planning, which has been a long concern of mine, 
is that you know we can accommodate at least some of that some of that with what you're proposing through the mayor thank you um thank you jesse i appreciate it the question that i have is um maybe this is what you were offering vice mayor uh, boomgarn is uh, the operations chief or the vacancy that you know bill fuller is leaving a big impact uh you know, um, as he's retiring. But as we worked on these grants and the safer grants and all of those duty, who's picking all that up since, is that part of the administration, is that you? So there's a lot of shuffling that would need to occur. Uh, Mr. Fuller took on, uh, like I said, the role of uh, two individuals. When you look in, in the fire service, there's five, I would look at it as five key hats that you need to wear. You need to have your, your fire chief, your administrative chief, which is handling uh, grants, things along those lines, an emergency operations um, chief, emergency management, um, an operations chief, and a training. Yes, you can take some of those hats, you can combine them into one individual, but when you start to get into five uh, with one individual, that, that gets to be a little bit of a concern, because technically right now, as of today, um, I have both of my assistant chief positions unfilled. So yes, in theory, that's five hats that I should be wearing at the time. There are some options that the city can uh, provide with grant writing. However, again, adding a lot of those things, putting them into one. The interim assistant chief that we have right now, he is taking on a, a certain portion of that role. But as we all know, in regards to being an interim, until again, new to this position, you really don't feel comfortable and dialed in to that until at least a year minimum. So uh, uh, I can't expect that individual to carry that huge, some of those huge loads at this time. Right. So the, the concerns I'm also um, hearing is uh, the one that we support other, other, you know, calls and other needs and mutual aid. But what is very um, heightens my uh, awareness and concerning even more is that we don't have these plans um, in place to respond to any, well, particular active shooter or some other emergency plan. That, and, and the expectation at this point, without all the staffing, you don't have the, the administrative um, staffing to lean on the expectation is that we have is that you're, you're the person to do all this. I, I, am I understanding that correctly? In the event that um, those positions become unfilled, then that would be correct, that I would be the primary contact. Yes, there's ways I can find to delegate some of those items out. However, just based upon the magnitude of some of them, it's difficult to delegate portions of those down to uh, a line battalion chief uh, due to the complexity of what they have on a daily basis with supervision, uh, incident command system, all things along those lines. But yes, uh, emergency management is, is, a, is a passion of mine. I've lived through that on some very significant incidents uh, throughout my career. And I know the importance of having those plans in place and having people trained and follow those plans so that it's just a, hey, this is what's occurring. We dive right into this on those large scale incidents versus the, the minor incidents that we might have uh, on a daily basis. And those plans are, are coordinated with the police department, aren't they not? And particular incidents, depending if there is an active shooter, some of those things are separate. We have two different plans going. I'm just curious to some of this coordination and the planning. I can, I can, I can speak on behalf of the, the fire department. I'll turn it over to the police because, again, active shooter would fall under the police department. However, on the fire department side, we are going to try to be involved in regards to a unified command system. And there's a lot of things that would play out in play that would affect the fire department and the emergency medicals component of it. So that we're providing the quickest level of care to people that are wounded. That would include police officers, civilians, and making sure that we're helping in any way we can on the emergency medical side. And so there's a lot of complexity that goes along with integrating the two agencies to make sure that it's done effectively. And so. Yes, those plans in place, but I'll turn that over to the police chief in regards to that component. I think the chief did a great job explaining that. But law enforcement, that is our, that's our thing is active shooter, not our thing. But that's the thing that we train on right. all the time and every time. And we do train with the fire on that as well. So 
We have a very, uh, we, we train with the, the, the schools and everything else. We have very good plans in place, and we have actual people that train the city, go to different businesses, and we do all kinds of um, additional training. And we will continue to work with the fire department. They, well, I, I appreciate the fact that both of you work together, but I think in li listening to Fire Chief Alexander that it's, he's new, new set of eyes, looking at things in a different perspective and trying to bring some of those emergency plans to up to speed and with the lack of administrative support that you have at this moment, to me that is concerning for you um, as you just started with us. Um, and uh, I mean, you've done a fantastic and amazing job and um, I want to be supportive of, of those efforts and be supportive of those efforts um, along with our uh, police. Um, and, and in particular with these times, if, if no one's watching the news, things are happening and, and um, both of your, your services, as I say it, is our, our police and our fire chief and our fire services are critical and essential. And so um, I appreciate the work and I appreciate the aspect of you bringing some things um, to my attention that I, I was not aware of. So thank you. All right. Thank you very much. Anybody have anything? Through the mayor. Yes, go ahead. Uh, Chief, thanks for uh, being here tonight and thanks for your work. Um, echoing what we've heard so far, um, and I'm going to start off with kind of an obvious question, is can we call Bill back? Is he available? <laughs> That's a very good question, and I can guarantee that uh, I've explored that option. There are some requirements that go along with that. Um, Mr. Fuller has a very specific skill set uh, that is going to be tremendously missed. However, there some, are some requirements in regards to retired annuitant uh, in, playing that out. And in the short term, that would not necessarily be an option. Thank you. And I think with what the council gave him tonight, he may not be in the right frame of mind to, uh, to come to work later on this evening. But uh, getting back on point, um, I, I want to echo what I've heard so far. I um, Just to look at the two different departments here. I'm looking at an entire executive team right here for the most part from PD. And then I look at the entire executive team for FD right there. Uh, Chief, as awesome as you are and as awesome as all these gentlemen are here, you're one person. You got to recharge the batteries and you got to have that fill underneath you. And looking at you know, just what you said, that Mr. Fuller was doing the job of multiple people. We haven't had an assistant chief. We haven't had a operations chief. We haven't had any of those positions. What is your idea of combining, if you were looking at minimum-wise, how many bodies would it take to really give us that effective executive team and FD that we could have a safe city and you guys could get everything you need done, done. Is it, we're going to get there with, with a uh, one division chief and um, an administrative clerk, or do we really need maybe a couple of division chiefs that are going to function in those roles? Uh, what's your thoughts on that? Well, the primary emphasis is to make sure that uh, I have that line staff going out responding to those daily calls. But to, to and this is a unique situation that we're all in with uh, COVID and everything going on. And, and so I understand it. So there's that time when you get to say, hey, there's the what would be optimal and what we can make work. So the scenario that you have before you tonight is I can make it work and still maintain and still function and still produce. What would really be beneficial is to have two division chiefs so that I can break that up uh, and having regards to a division chief in charge of operations, but then also have a division chief that is maintaining those minimum training standards to reduce that liability to the department, to the city, making sure we're hitting those fundamental goals, everything, and then allowing myself to be able to take on a little bit of more of that emergency operations planning, strategic planning, um, things along those lines to look at the, the larger picture and prepare for the greater scope. So uh, to break up those, those five hats. Okay. And I know that both departments have by far never recovered from what happened years ago. So I, I get that. We're fighting an uphill battle across the board. Um, I'm going to ask you the same question that I asked uh, Chief Landon. Have have you received any um, feedback from the, the fire union as far as what their thoughts are on this? And what I meant earlier, Chief, when I said from the top down, is I, I know that 
the council kind of dictated, you know, we want this and this is what we want to see across the board. I'm looking to see if any of our, you know, unions or whatnot have any ideas that would they may bring up to us as well through this whole process. And I'm a proponent of bringing everyone in early and often because we never know where an idea is going to come from. So has the uh, fire union had any ideas on this? I know that, um, you know, they were... Um, um, schedule for negotiations this year and everything else, but what's the sentiment? Have they come up with anything? Have they given you any feedback? So right now, labor and management has a great working relationship. Uh, we talk frequently and we've had those discussions. I'd hate to speak for them on behalf of their thought process of where we're going, but uh, just we're work today to try to schedule a meeting for Thursday to have some more in-depth discussions about options and uh, the very creative individuals, uh, as I communicated to them. Uh, I'm one individual. I, I, I don't have all the answers. Uh, I try to devote as much as I can to be creative in regards to these, but I'm very uh, receptive to receiving information, ideas, thought process to go forward, and they understand that. And I appreciate that, Chief. And actually, the word you just said is really the word I was searching for and what I was trying to say, and that's receptive because that's really what I'm looking for, is we've got to make decisions as a council, and I want us to be very receptive of any idea that comes up, whether it's from the newest recruit that we've had in any of the departments or from one of our department heads. We never know where that idea is going to come from. So uh, thank you for giving me that word, So um, and thank you. Yeah. To the mayor. I'm going to change this up a little bit. Um, first of all, I want to thank the chiefs and all the department heads for and the ones that are going to be coming up after the chief for these presentations. Uh, I went through this with the last group of individuals from 2008 to 2014. We all took it hard. Uh, there was a lot of uh, bad things uh, going on the the uh, council back then you know they wanted a balanced budget they did things they had to do to make the balance the budget balanced I wanted to make this uh, comment for our council I know uh, Mark got lucky he retired just at the right time of life he didn't get to have to go through the recession as bad as all of us anyway the vehicle replacement fund council's asking this gentleman to cut his budget or give two hundred eighty eight thousand dollars out of his vehicle replacement fund to balance the budget so this is why our fire department is $128,000 short, because years ago, the council asked that department to get, make cuts and to balance his budget. So he gave up money for several years, not just one, to make his balanced budget. And that's why that fund is short at this time. And I just wanted to make to let the council know about this. I was going to wait, but that's sitting right in front of us. And I just wanted to make that comment to let everybody know at this time that that's why the vehicle replacement funds are short, because we had to balance the budget years ago. We had to balance the budget for um, six, uh, seven years. It had to be balanced, and we were short. So I just want to let the council know about that. Thank you. Thank you, Chief, for everything you do. Through the mayor. Yep. Um, I want to clarify that the vehicle replacement fund from the time that I was made the chief of this city has always been a tool for budgets. It hasn't just in 2008. There were many, many times when uh, there were questions about extending vehicle lives and all kinds of maneuvers uh, that occurred with that vehicle replacement fund. So just to expand on Councilman Cardoza's, it, it wasn't just a 2008 maneuver. It's been going on for quite a long time. I was a worker bee, not a department head. Thank you, Vice Mayor. All right, thank you very much, Chief. Much appreciated. All right. So now I'm back to represent Public Works. All right. And I'm very excited about that. So you'll have to excuse me because I have nine slides coming up. Um, since there's three different funding sources within Public Works, I'm going to cover general fund, water, and wastewater funds. One thing that I would like to note is that within the general fund is the street div division. The street division has its own um, revenue source in terms of gas tax and other funds, but it's brought through the general fund, and so um, they are grouped into that. 
So I'm going to go over the 2.5% scenarios first. So in regard to the general fund, um, our 2.5% scenario, we're slightly over 2.5% with this value of $236,513. So in terms of salaries and benefits, uh, Scarlett Harris, the administrative assistant, was promoted to administrative analyst. And so um, we would propose to freeze the administrative assistant position for one year. I have to say that she's been very gracious to continue to fulfill some of the duties of the administrative assistant. So we're not fully utilizing her at the efficient capacity of an analyst because I'm still requesting that she perform some of the functions of the assistant. And um, like I said, she's been very gracious in doing that. Um, I'm also in a very fortunate position in that because I'm the interim city manager right now and anticipated to be so for a few months, my department um, benefits from that savings in terms of having the public works director position open. And then also we would propose to reduce the extra help budgets um, for um, primarily streets and then electrical. Material services and supplies. This is mainly through, um, one of the things that I just want to address is right now the senior center is, uh, is custodial services are provided through an outside company. And so to get to this $48,825, one of the things that we're proposing is to take back the cleaning of the senior center. Um, again, in terms of agencies, I feel like Yuba City has the best uh, custodial staff on the planet. Uh, these individuals care deeply for um, our facilities and um, you know they, they truly care about the product that they provide. In terms of vehicle replacement, this is a vehicle that is funded for engineering. The vehicle um, has been out of service and gone for quite a few months now and we've been able to live without it within engineering and so we would propose to take the money from that to put towards the two and a half percent reduction scenario. In terms of the water fund, um, again, because the administrative assistant and public works director are funded 50% general fund, 25% water fund, 25% wastewater fund, we would again see the savings in the water fund. In addition, we have a vacant water treatment plant maintenance supervisor that's been vacant for um, probably a couple years now. And so we would continue to freeze that for six months and one of the reasons that it's been frozen is that we do have a, um, a person on staff that has uh, shown a lot of promise. And so, um, you know, this is a position that we feel like we internally we could fill at some point in time, but we would propose to freeze for six months under this scenario. The water treatment plant operator four, we would propose to freeze for three months. So this is assuming that we fill the chief plant operator position. We have a vacant chief plant operator. If we filled the chief plant operator internally, this would then create an opening at the operator four level. We would propose to freeze that for three months and then op underfill it at the operator two level. We have more success in um, getting operator twos, building them up. And so what's the difference between oper operator two and operator three? Operator two cannot run the plant on their own. They have to spend time um, with an operator three. They need to get the appropriate certification and then they're able to operate the plant on their own. But that allows us to kind of grow our own. And then also um, that's an extremely difficult field to recruit in and that seems to be the level we're able to recruit. Again, reduce the extra help budget, not proposing to impact material services and supplies. And in terms of vehicle replacement fund, we're in a situation where some of the vehicles are overfunded. And so we would take that overage and apply it to the funding. On the wastewater fund, again, the administrative assistant public works director carry across. Um, with the promotion of one of our operators to the chief plan operator, we have a vacant operator three position that we would freeze for three months and then again underfill. We have a budgeted operator and training position that we would freeze for one year. We have a vacant regulatory compliance administrator position that we would freeze for three months. Um, the reason we've been able to keep this position vacant is we've been utilizing professional services to utilize consultants who specialize in regulatory compliance. By not filling this position, um, we would either continue to utilize the, um, the consultants or um, figure out how to coordinate with existing staff. Again, reduce the extra help budget. Um, in regard to material services and supplies, um, 
again, a reduction of the extra or the professional services. In relation to the vehicle replacement fund, we have some overages. Any, any questions on the two and a half percent scenarios? I have a, through the mayor. I have a real quick one. Um, I'm gonna try to remain optimistic and say that you know by September, things are gonna look a lot better. Is that the reason for the three months? That you're suggesting is is just to kind of wait and see. Yeah, because we're um, you know we know that the recommendation is to analyze on a quarterly basis, and so you know if this was implemented, then be to be able to reevaluate in three months. Okay. The other thing that I want to note is that we really tried to focus on existing vacant positions to not impact filled positions, and so therefore, um, as I get into the seven and a half percent scenario it gets really tight in terms of material services and supplies, and I'll talk about that in a minute. Um, but it was, it was very important for us to try to maintain the staffing that we have. Recognizing that reduction of extra help budgets does impact us significantly as well. For the 5% scenario, um, so again, we have freezing the administrative assistant, public works director. In engineering, we have a vacant construction inspector position. Um, we only, the times that we bring uh, retired annuitants in, a retired annuitant in to um, help us with construction inspection is when we have a lot of projects going on or our senior construction inspectors on vacation or out of the office. And um, so we feel like we can freeze this position for a year. Again, reduce extra help budgets. In terms of material services and supplies, again, it's looking at reducing. So this one continues to assume that um, the custodians take over the cleaning of the senior center. It's also reduction in uh, professional services and heat and power for the electrical division. Since we converted streetlights to LED, we do have a little bit of savings there. And then again, that one vehicle for engineering. For the water fund, um, you notice the water treatment plant maintenance supervisor is frozen for one year. We're now also freezing the chief plant operator for three months. The regulatory compliance administrator, again, would be frozen for three months, reducing the extra help budget. And the material services and supplies, this is where we start to get into more of the professional services, um, training, chemicals. The vehicle replacement fund is removal of two staff vehicles from vehicle replacement and then some the overages that were utilized in the 2.5% scenario. In the wastewater fund, um, again, the regulatory compliance administrator for three months, reducing the extra help budget more. Material services and supplies, you can see this starts to ramp up. $378,000, this is hitting professional services, chemicals, um, training, and then in terms of vehicle replacement, this is, an, again, an over-accumulation. We're in the vehicle replacement fund. We have some vehicles that have accumulated more cash than what's projected for the replacement. And so we're fortunate to be able to have that as a potential option. So any questions on the 7.5% uh, scenario, or 5% scenario? Okay. 7.5% scenario. Um, so salary and benefits stay the same. Material services and supplies, this is, again, professional services and heat and power, and then that one vehicle from engineering. For the water fund, um, now the water treatment plant maintenance supervisor is, again, frozen for one year. The chief plant operator is frozen for one, for one year. This is very significant, as we have a water treatment plant supervisor that still has a, a few years left in his career. However, the importance of getting somebody in that chief plan operator position to be able to fulfill that duty, hopefully um, you know, groom them someday, because we like to groom in-house for um, to promote up. This chief plan operator position is a key role within that division. They're typically the ones that do the reporting, um, respond to the state, um, monitor, you know, compliance and um, also coordinate with the operators on their schedules and activities. Another hard hit would be regulatory compliance administrator frozen for one year. Um, again, this one's very tough, uh, tough one to swallow just because of the impacts. As you guys are aware, in the water and wastewater industry, there's ever-changing regu regulations coming at the city with no corresponding um, revenue sources. And so having somebody that's solely dedicated to monitoring regulations to make sure we're in compliance is um, extremely important. 
Uh, material services and supplies, this is again, professional services and, and hitting those chemicals again. And then the vehicle replacement fund, again, was removal of two vehicles and then some, a little bit of over accumulation. Do the wastewater. Diana, I'm sorry to interrupt you. On the uh, regulatory compliance administrator, it, it, wouldn't it be cheaper to hire one than pay for a consultant to do the work for us? Why, well, yes, it would. Okay. <laughs> Which is why we would like to hire one. Okay. However, well. when you're in a situation where you're evaluating budgets, of course, you figure out, you know, ways to try to address that, um, doing the best that you can. So we would still be utilizing uh, professional services and consultants, utilizing them less. Um, I also have to say we're very, very blessed with the operators that we have and the staff that we have in that we have a lot of historical knowledge within not only public works, but throughout the city. And that's one of the reasons that this city is so efficient is because we have people with a lot of institutional knowledge and um, with these operators and the supervisors, they do a tremendous job of um, you know doing their homework, keeping us in compliance, having conversations. And uh, like I said, this one would this one would hurt. All of these scenarios hurt. Um, but we also understand that this is a, an exercise we need to go through. Thank you, Diana. Mm -hmm. On the wastewater fund again. Um, the regulatory compliance administrator freezing for one year. So the, the one, the material services and supplies, this one makes me nervous. Um, this is professional services and this is chemicals. So when you get into treating water, treating wastewater, it's so dependent upon the environment, the weather, the constituents in the water, um, you know, and, and so we are doing our best to try to figure out how to shave off of that budget Honestly, it makes me nervous in terms of the amount that we're cutting chemicals, but I would prefer to do that than consider cutting um, positions. Um, you know, when you get into public works and you talk about, even though they're not, going back to Mr. Suki's question in terms of, you know, why are they not considered safety? So from the, um, the budget standpoint, they're not considered safety, but in terms of the services that they provide to the public, they are considered safety. And uh, it's extremely important to be able to have the tools and supplies to be able to do their job. So with that, um, I'd be happy to answer any questions related to public works. Through the mayor. Yeah, go ahead. Ms. Langley, uh, the question I have is you talked about in reduction of services that would be training and what like that. Um, what is going to be the impact if we cut back on the training? Because then all the operators have to have their certifications and every it's, it's training like any other department. What kind of impact is that going to have? Are we going to still be able to maintain all their minimum uh, requirements and training? Or are we talking about impacting that? No, we would make sure that um, that individuals are able to keep up with on the certifications required for their job. Um, we also try to send staff to training. Maybe it's not a certification required for their job, but it's a safety training. You know, we would continue to do those. Um, where we would cut the training budget would be more so going to conferences. We have always encouraged staff to attend conferences because that's a great way to network. It's a great way to find out the latest technology, what's um, innovative within the industry. Water and wastewater, there's a lot of innovation happening all the time. And so by cutting the training budgets, it'd really be related to the ability to go to those types of conferences. Okay, thank you. Good question. Anybody else? Through, through the mayor, thank go you. Go ahead. Uh, Diana, um, thank you for being so succinct. That's really um, good and helpful. Now, the question I have is um, in reference to the chemicals. So the chemicals are part of the, some of this reduction? Yes, materials, chemicals fall under material services and supplies. You can imagine we spend um, hundreds of thousands of dollars on chemicals for treatment. But however, I will say that traditionally, if you look at the utilities budgets, we have been able to save significantly on our budgets on an annual basis. And so even though we've put forward these reduction scenarios, staff has done an excellent job in years past in trying to minimize expenditures to be able to save um, as much money as we can, recognizing that it goes back to the originating funds. Okay, um, so we're not cutting and the health concerns within the water, we still, I mean, we're good. No, we we feel like we could still 
we could we would still be able to operate okay. under the seven and a half percent scenario. We're cutting it close. And could I sit here and guarantee you that yes, we're going to be able to save this? No, I I can't. Um, do I think that we could get close? In evaluating it, the supervisors did feel like they could get close with that. Um, with this, you know, like I said, the seven and a half percent scenario makes me really nervous. The five percent scenario, nervous. The two and a half percent scenario, okay. Um, None of us want to be up here in front of council talking about these scenarios. And like I said, it's it's we understand that it's it's where we're at and we need to do it. But um, you know, none of these scenarios make any of us feel good, or um, and it will impact services. One example is going to be streets. We're not going to be able to have the extra help that goes out there and picks up the couch within two hours of a phone call. That couch might sit there for a while because we're doing a different operation that day. We're not going to be able to do multiple operations where we have a concrete crew and we have a paving crew. Everybody might be on the concrete crew that day. And so streets uh, is going to see the impact of this, just like the other divisions. I was going to I was going to ask you that. So, OK, I'm, I'm going to try to be optimistic, as someone else said on the dais up here, you know, that three months later, the money comes in, COVID-19, somehow taxes. My crystal ball is saying good things. I, no, thank you. Thank you. Mm -hmm. All right, thank you. Thank you, Diana. Good evening, Council, again. So the uh, community services, obviously, as someone mentioned earlier, is the, is the quality of life that we provide. Um, I am a, a realist, and uh, you will see a 5% and a 7.5%, because when uh, back in 2008, 2009, we kind of keep going back to those days as well, uh, community services, Parks and Recreation uh, lost approximately 60% of their staffing at that time. We are back to about 50% now of from that 2008-2009. I say I'm a realist because I'm, I'm not going to provide a 2.5% because I'm pretty confident in being in this position as long as I have been that uh, there, we are, for community services, we're probably going to start at 5% or 75 and I understand that. So looking at the 5% scenario, Really, it comes down to what I call um, modifying events um, that you would see as far as what, what would 5% look like in community services. Um, it is the events that we put on throughout the years, the year, um, and then it's uh, reducing our extra help, materials, and supplies. And of course, we keep <laughs> talking about this topic, but our vehicle replacement fund. That vehicle replacement fund of 84000 uh, which is a very large number, is a result of extending vehicles over a long period of time, mostly in parks uh, and one in recreation, I believe. Um, and so we've been able to capture that for a one-time savings. Now, obviously, if we go to sustain something past uh, fiscal year of 2021, um, we will have to figure out, come up with you know, um, that number as well. So I, I guess I just want to make it clear this is a one-time um, savings, as it is for most of the departments. So the 7.5%, uh, it gets, uh, now we're talking about a position. This is our recreation coordinator position. Uh, this was a position that was held by Kelsey Myers who promoted and took a position uh, in Roseville. Uh, and so this was an open position. We were literally, you know, five days from uh, a person starting before COVID hit. So um, out of the few things I'm thankful for, I'm, I'm thankful for the fact that this individual um, I did not come on. And so we've decided to freeze or propose to freeze that position um, for one year. Uh, I talked about minimal events being uh, reduced at the 5%. Um, the, the events would be even more minimal 
um, as relates to that, because that position um, put on all those events. And an additional thing that it affects is our volunteer program. Um, our volunteer program um, is specifically uh, through the Parks and Recreation Department. Uh, it uh, helps uh, get volunteers for our recreation programs, for our parks, uh, summer, summer at City Hall, that was part of the program a while ago. Uh, we've got animal services where we see a lot of volunteers. Um, and then in addition, we also have um, our youth commission that this person uh, uh, oversaw. The youth commission would not go away, uh, but again, there would be reduced activity in that uh, area as well. And then uh, the Adopt-A-Park, our Eagle Scout projects, um, all that uh, stuff that people sign up for, um, that was coordinated through this position as well. So you would see you know, that uh, a reduction in that obviously as well. Materials and supplies, roughly the same. Of course, the vehicle replacement at the 80, close to 85,000. Um, let me just check my notes before. That's it. Thank you. Any questions? Through the mayor. Go ahead. Uh, Mr. McIntyre, just for clarification, because you refer to reduced events that we do, um, events mean a lot of things across the city. So from your standpoint, can you clarify what you're talking about as far as events? Sure will. Thank you for that question. Uh, for the events, uh, concerts in the park, movies in the park, uh, 4th of July, uh, the DBA uh, functions that the city helps supports as far as the Christmas tree lighting, the parade, and then earlier I mentioned the Youth Commission events. Those would be the events I, was, I would be talking about. Just to follow up on that, a couple of those... Um, don't we have line items in our budget for uh, like the Christmas stroll and things of that nature? It's, I was gonna say, so we're not saying we're not going to support some of those community events. It would just be your part that you do of those. Yes, exactly. Okay, <laughs> all right, thank you. As it relates to the DBA, that, that is correct. All right, thank you very much, Brad. Thank you. Oh, okay, go ahead. I should race him. Mayor, members of the council, um, my name is Spencer Morrison, finance director. Material supplies and services cuts are difficult in the finance division because of impacts on compliance and needs of supportive departments. Our MSNS consists of items like utility bill processing, postage, audits, credit card fees, actuarial services, tax audits, cost allocation, mandatory state cost recovery, et cetera. So we're looking to salary and benefits in the finance division especially, and a mix in the IT division. Freezing the vacant accountant two position uh, for three months and bringing some network assessments in house will reduce costs in finance and IT by two and a half percent. Freezing the vacant accountant two position for 10 months will leave our professional accounting series shorthanded causing increased stress on senior accounting staff to compensate and complete tasks. Bringing a larger portion of network assessments in-house will compete with customer service support causing potential delays in resolving technical issues for all departments. Additionally, eliminating the IT extra help and overtime budgets will further slow customer service efforts and delay network security upgrades.
the seven and a half percent scenario relies, uh, there's, I have two options I'm going to present. The first option relies on the willingness of retirement eligible team member retirements, a retirement, which may be assisted by financial incentives should this council decide to go that direction. We would also reclassify our senior account clerk to account uh, administrative analyst one to allow for a shift of duties from the accountant one staff, which helps with the loss of the accountant two for one year. We would increase overtime to help cover clerical or accounting tasks from falling further behind. It also brings more technical professional services in-house, which may require additional, additional training for our IT team members. If the retirement incentive is not an option, the field representative uh, furlough would result in savings of 50400 but could still result in an increase of extra help of $23,000. We have an option two for seven and a half percent. The second option for a seven and a half percent reduction would furlough a customer service team member for one year, resulting in increased drop calls and longer lines at the front counter. And the shorthanded back office staff will be stretched too thin to cover the front counter reliably. Busy customer contact days will reduce efficient processing of other tasks, such as collections, liens, proactive customer contacts, and balancing among other daily duties. And that's what I have for you tonight. Is there no questions? I'll turn it over to questions Ben. from council. All right. All right, thank you, Spencer. The mayor, I just want to make a quick comment. On the, uh, you're good, Spencer. You're okay, but I just want to comment on the finance department. They answer a lot of phone calls, especially when utility bills go out, and especially during shutoffs. So if we lost a couple of employees <clears throat> to that, I couldn't imagine with that department. You know, just it would be very uh, a downfall for that department if we lose those employees. If we have to lose those employees for something like that, especially at those times of the month. Anyway, thank you. All right, so I'm up. Um, so good, good evening. So I've been Murray, your development services department director. And so, um, so really, as others have stated, I'm really the advocate for my department, and, um, but also understand the need for the budget. So the budget needs and how we're going to get there. And so really, to be straightforward, the takeaway that I want to present for the development services department is that we're lean. Right now, um, due, to the, due to staffing from 2008, various um, recruitments over time and for various reasons we are lean. The department um, is basically about $1.5 million, about 3% of that general fund budget. We're in charge of um, building, planning, housing, and code enforcement. And so with that, right now this, um, this past fiscal year or this fiscal year, we're looking at about $1.3 million plus in revenue for the building permit side, plus a valuation of about $73 million that goes um, towards assessed value that it, that brings in additional property taxes to the city. And then also with that, we administer housing funds that come through from state and federal agencies. And so right now I'm running about one full-time employee for each um, required position. And so really I'm right on the edge right now that if I have one inspector, which um, we're, we're basically we're requesting to freeze through this scenario with it being a a redundancy, but it's really leaving us vulnerable that with that, with the current one inspector that's running, if he drops off or if we have a retirement or a health reason or any sort of vacancy, we run into an issue where we're going to have to consult out for a, a higher cost at a reduced service. And so really that's, that's my takeaway. It's tough, just like the other departments have said, um, all of these cuts are tough, but we'll get through them. It's just a long-term, it's not a long-term solution where we're not, where it's not going to have impacts to have cost inefficiencies and service. And so, so with that, um, right now we have a vacant position with the building inspector. One, with the economy booming before the COVID-19, it was really hard to recruit. Um, we, did a, we did a temp transfer um, from an internal employee transfer with some interest, that, but with the COVID-19 and the, the limits on, um, on that, that transfer, we're, we're proposing to leave it vacant until um, we'll see how this, this comes and, and plays out. The seven and a half scenario, that also utilizes um, a current 
vacancy through the planning manager position where we're basically, I'm basically proposing to underfill it with um, um, an assistant planner and then build them up over time. And so, but with that, there, it's not a straight savings from a plan, planning manager to an assistant planner that the, those savings from the, the $160,000 cost for a planning manager versus a, a $80,000 cost to assistant planner, I'm gonna have to use some of that savings to pay for consultant services to, to rely on um, um, you know, more of a senior level staff for um, environmental analysis and, and some technical studies. So with that, I'd be happy to answer any questions. Um, it's pretty straightforward for my department. Through the mayor, Ben, um, I think um, we clearly, at least in my opinion, I clearly know that your department is very lean. And um, since you stepped in, you have um, brought, you're bringing us up to speed in areas that we have been as a city uh, far behind and, and haven't um, in the quality of this service, what you're doing. Um, I'm very impressed. And um, understand um, I, these decisions are not taken lightly. These are very challenging decisions. Um, and knowing how hard you've been working with your team to, to bring up that level of customer service, all of these projects, development, I mean, the, the list goes on and on. And um, I, I recognize that and I just wanted to um, say that to you so thank you i, I appreciate it my team appreciates it and um, we'll continue working with the city departments as a whole to, to keep moving forward now ben it looks like here on the graph here that you did the same thing that uh, mr mcintyre did you just jumped right to five i did and so with the yeah. with the department being so relatively small compared to the the dollar amounts for police fire and public works with that current vacancy, that really gets me right to the 5% right now. I'm just confirming that. Thank you very much. Appreciate the effort and all the work you folks do. Terrell. Evening, Mayor and Council. So I did things a little bit different as I just skipped the 5% pretty much and just kind of went to, from the 2.5%. So um, administration, um, I more or less consider, it's kind of all lumped together, but it's um, four separate budgets. You have um, the city council budget, city manager budget, city clerk budget, economic, I guess it's five, economic development, and the non-departmental, except for the travel expenses. And so um, putting it together, um, we have a, it's, a, it's in the budget for an administrative um, intern. It's an extra help um, part-time position. Um, we haven't filled it in a couple years. Um, so it, it's, it's no big deal to freeze that. So it's not painful at all. Again, we are benefiting from um, Diana Langley serving as our interim city manager because that gives us a large um, budget savings from the regular city manager pay to the um, public works department director pay. Um, and then my position as I am retiring will freeze for three to six months, depending on when the next person will be in. And then the undesignated position was added last year and um, we never did fill it and um, we're proposing to leave it um, frozen again for another year. And then the city clerk's office had an administrative clerk part-time. We're recommending to freeze that again. I was able to use it um, with two different people last year. It is kind of hard to fill a part-time position with no benefits, but the two people that we did have for a couple months each really did a good job, but that can be frozen as well. Material services and supplies. Um, so, so most of our departments, um, it's office supplies and um, salaries. Um, that are hard to do. The other, the other um, thing that we have are consultant services, which are very much um, council's um, direction and the city manager's um, direction of, of how they want to move it forward. And so unlike um, some departments, it's not like um, we're going to have to cut things. What is this? Things aren't going to be proactive going for things with consultant services. And so um, proposing to um, most of the, the reductions are coming from the economic development 
department. And so um, for the two and a half percent material services and supplies, um, recommending um, deleting the, um, so that's 5%. So um, from economic development, reducing the advertising budget, which is used for promoting the city um, by, and the meetings that occur, except for keeping a little bit for um, the boards and for the building and developer meetings that um, Diana and Ben are having with our local developers. Um, the digital front door team, reducing that. Um, that was a, that's a internal um, team meeting that, um, um, we have a representative from every department that attends and they look for um, innovative items to communicate with our citizens better. And there's a small budget in there and um, that they can buy a program or test it out or something to be able to use. Then the big one in there is, uh, it's not included in here because um, it's already, um, um, council's already considering it and what they wanna do with it is the tourism budget that's added to the economic development. The 5% scenario, again, it's the same um, salary and benefit savings, but we're gonna be adding um, some professional services from economic development. Um, the economic development pro um, professional services contains things like um, the consultant that you're using for the master tax exchange agreement. And um, I think there's two that we've been using. And, um, and then some possible money for, since we don't have an in-house economic, if you guys um, want to use uh, some consultant services for that. So keeping some of that money available for you. And then I also have um, every other year, the city clerk's office pays for um, either the boards and commissions dinner or, and then the, the odd year we pay for um, the mandatory AB 123 ethics training. However, that can be done online. It's, um, it's a lot harder to get compliance when they have to do it on their own online. But that's an option too, and that's about $2,000. So, um, under non-departmental, um, that's the item that um, Councilmember Shaw was asking about. So the um, sister city has um, said that they are not going to be um, coming this October and we're not gonna be invited to go back in February because of the COVID. So that cost is being reduced. The Downtown Business Association canceled their um, summer stroll. So I took that money out as a reduction. Um, then the city, um, staff mans a um, booth at the Yuba Center Fair, and there's some money for that that I took out because I don't know whether we'll be doing that or not. And then uh, we took some money for the um, Fly the Mission Academy. Um, council had already decided through the city manager that that wasn't gonna occur this um, fall. So also taking out, um, so also taking out costs for replacing banners on Bridge Street and um, and then if the um, uh, restrictions aren't lifted, then, then the cost for sponsoring the winter stroll. So the other costs for um, the organizations for the community contributions and the events, um, I left those in there because that's up, up to council's um, discretion what they wanted to fund or not. So um, we were accepting applications right when COVID hit, so we did get several and um, those can be provided to you if you want to know. So the seven and a half percent just kind of um, keeps moving on with um, reducing the um, professional service accounts for um, whatever council wants to be able to do. If you need a consultant for some of the projects like the Bogue Stewart master plan or in-house, since we don't have economic development um, department in-house de development, economic development services. And I'm happy to answer any questions. 
Thanks, Sarah. Looks like you did a pretty deep dive in there. I guess the question is um, in looking at the uh, proposed budget, not the not the reductions for city council. I noticed there were some uh, significant increases in professional services and such. When you looked at at administration, did you look at city council and 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 pair back from ours? I think we need to lead by example. Um, I did. Um, I'm not sure why you didn't see that, but that was um, part of the information that I had forwarded to Diana. And so, um, so we did increase. We, I just moved money. Haven't received any. Just I'm sorry to interrupt. Oh, haven't received. She it. hasn't forwarded me anything yet. I think she's still compiling oh, okay. information. So I, I will say that the reductions for the city council is in the staff report. There's a there's a page in the staff report that's specific to the reductions that's being proposed for the city council budget. Okay. That's not reflected up here, though. It's part of it, yes. So um, I I just missed that part. So um, as far as the two and a half percent scenario, um, I'm suggesting for city council budget, um, seven hundred dollars for the um, forms and supplies, and that was just kind of like reducing um, costs of frames and um, certificates that we spend on um, events like honoring a um, grand opening. Or... So we also moved over um, $30,000 from the non-departmental budget for um, tra council travel. So you got, so the council can uh, monitor their own expenses a lot easier than when it was lumped in with everybody else. And I was um, proposing to reduce that by $25,000, leaving $5,000 for miscellaneous stuff that needs to be done. And plus also you are having um, uh, um, probably a new mayor um, next year. And so there's the League of California Cities new mayor conference that um, might be wanting to attend. Um, and I'm also uh, proposing um, um, deleting the uh, council closed session um, meals. And, um, and then for the 7% scenario, uh, for council, um, traditionally, um, we have a, um, a professional facilitator come in for um, doing the priority and goal setting session for the city council and executive team and all the processes that go along with that. And we usually budget about $12,000 for that and another $1,000 for the venue and, and supplies. And um, that's part of the 7.5% um, reduction scenario that I'm proposing. So the reason that um, it's in the 7.5% and not getting rid of it all together is because you are planning on hiring a new city manager and there is an election year coming up and so the dynamics of the council could change. And so it might be um, important for next spring or you know January, February to be able to um, regroup and talk with your new city manager, hopefully, for Diana. So. <laughs> So um, having that in place um, and not um, deleting it yet, I think is, is a good recommendation. Thank you. I appreciate you taking the effort to do that. Like I said, I think it's important for us to, to, to feel some of the uh, burden of, of the reduction. So I appreciate what you did. Thank you. Do you have something? Tara, one question. If you could go back to, I think you're two and a half percent. Oh, actually, it's still there. On the um, interim city manager savings, we have six months there. I know that it was on public works reduction scenario as well. I just want to confirm that we're not double counting. If you can maybe elaborate that. No, I moved uh, Diana's salary for the six months over to um, the city manager's office, and I deducted the prior city manager's pay that was budgeted. All together. Okay. All right. Thank you. And there's a good difference. Right. Okay. Thank you. Good evening Hello. again. 
last but not least, human resources. So um, we have all of our uh, scenarios are surrounding uh, material supplies and services. So as you know, HR is primarily an internal service provider, and many of the proposed reductions are from accounts that are impacted by city recruitments. And so those are advertising, testing, employment physicals, site testing, travel meeting, and interview panels. So that's all having that travel and meeting is all associated with interview panels. And then also onboarding. And so as you move up in the scenarios, there's more money um, that is reduced from those budgets. What does get added to it as you um, go up to the seven or five percent, excuse me, is employee awards. So during the recession, the last recession, we you know um, reduced the employee awards just to a simple um, ceremony, um, recognition ceremony that was held in the council chambers, and did away with the formal um, employee uh, awards. And then we also start reducing at the five percent level training programs and aids, um, which is, and then also the safety program as we get into the seven and a half. And that are, the program was built, that safety, or the training program in AIDS was a program that was built um, by employees within the city. It was called Target Learning. And it provided training for all employees um, and it offered training. So I am recommending that to be reduced as, as well as some safety training. And the reason for that is that um, just due to um, social distancing, tra providing training at this time, it just, um, it just, it seems like a, a large hurdle for us. So um, you will see, and uh, many of you know that I do have a vacant uh, human resources tech. The reason why I'm not putting it on there is um, normally during these times, and um, we see a lot of increases in you know time spent on labor relations and personnel matters. And so we already, um, Prior to this, COVID-19, we needed that position to help um, with just regular reporting requirements that human resources is responsible for. When we do see a recession or any type of economic downturn, we see things shift in human resources towards more personnel matters and also more um, employee relations issues. So that is my presentation. Thank you. Any questions? Nope, we'll have an opportunity to dig down deeper, I'm sure, but thank you for the report. And... So I'm just going to wrap it up here. Yeah. All right, so for summary, projecting a $3.5 million shortfall for fiscal year 2021. Um, options available are any combination of discretionary funds, department budget reductions, or bargaining unit discussions. In terms of implementation, we're recommending that council approach this with a strategy of implement, monitor, and reassess. Have the finance director provide quarterly budget updates, select options to implement July 1st, monitor over the next three months, and then reassess to determine if additional measures are needed. And really balance cutting too much too soon versus too little too late. Um, next steps, we have a special council workshop scheduled for next Tuesday at 6 p.m. here in the council chambers. It will be a virtual meeting again and then um, hoping to get direction from council at that point in time so we can adopt a budget on June 16th. However, if council needs additional time, we still have a couple of weeks within the month of June to adopt the budget. And so, uh, you know, willing to take as much time as we need to vet council's questions and assist with making decisions in terms of how to address this shortfall. And with that, that concludes the uh, presentations. All right, anything, nothing. Any public comment by chance? Um, no more than All what right. you've already Grace, gotten. did you have something? I saw you reaching for the red button. <laughs> You're watching me, Mayor. Uh, I, I'm just impressed by the um, work, the effort in, in this, in providing us the amount of detail, information, um, and conversations, so. I'm grateful for all of you and how you've um, stepped up to give us um, the um, amount of options and um, the decisions, as I said earlier, are not going to be easy. It's going to be challenging. It's going to be difficult. Um, but I feel as those decisions are played out, um, it's because we had a, a collaborative conversation. We hope that within your teams you have that discussion with your teams and be able to um, find some challenges in this and then um, I'm, I'm hoping that 
and challenges with options, but I'm hoping that looking at the three month quarterly review as some of that recommendation is, um, yes, we may be looking at two cutting it, or, or reductions or whatever we're looking at. Um, it is a, 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 a balancing act, but I think that if we end up having um, more funds than we anticipated, that's a good um, that's a good problem to have instead of having to cut or reduce more. So thank you and um, tremendous amount of work that is not overlooked and 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 utilized in, in everything that I do. So thank you. Can I go? Yeah. Just real quick, Dino. When you uh, just for clarification on what you had envisioned, I, I concur with the uh, the incremental approach based on how how this uh, evolves. But when we talk about implement, monitor, and reassess, is is do you mean by that start out with a three point five and then see where we go up or down from there, or you maybe partial, or is it what did you have in mind, or if you're even comfortable answering that? I'm kind of curious to know what you're. Well, I'll tell you what my personal thought was yeah. um, in terms of this is to not implement right away at the three and a half, okay. 3.5 million, just because the, the numbers are so squishy right now. Right. And to, um, you know, proceed forward with something that council's comfortable with. And then, like I said, to be able to monitor that over the next three months and, and see where it's looking like it's going to land. The, the one thing that um, I would would be difficult to do is to come in and make massive cuts and then find out that, oh, the economy's recovered. And that's a good thing to do. But when you look at the scenarios and the impacts to the departments and to the staff, um, it's significant. The other thing that, you know, we just have to also keep in mind is the meet and confer requirements. Right. Okay. Sir, did you have something? Thank you. Yeah, kind of following up on that, you know, I, I need to make sure I I message this correctly. I, I know there's a lot of apprehension out there amongst the folks that call themselves Yuba City employees, and there's a lot of, of concern about uh, you know their positions or what's going to happen and the good service that they all provide. And and um, I think it's important to note that as we sit here and and consider making decisions, we want to try to at least uh, message to those folks how much we do value them. And that uh, uh, I think that we're, we want to, to do what's right for the city, but also what's right for them. And, uh, and know that their, their work here is very valued and that if there's a way where we can continue to move forward and move cautiously, I think that's an appropriate way to do it rather than just go to, uh, you know, using the machete right now. Uh, let's, let's see how things play out a little bit. So I would uh, I would support your personal opinion of let's let's move slowly but surely, but also realize that uh, there's been a lot of work here since 2008 to get things right, and that um, there's not a lot there's not a lot of meat on the bone here. And uh, when we start talking about some of these cuts, it's it's cuts to services that our our citizens uh, have come to uh, rely on. And, and that they need. I don't think there's a lot of fluff here. Um, I know some may disagree with me out there in the, in the audience, but as one who is, who's been through this and one who's looking at this from both the inside and the outside, um, I would echo the words of uh, appreciate the department heads and their staff's willingness to take a hard look at what's out there and, and come up with scenarios that would help us. And I'm looking forward to the employee groups as Councilman Shaw has mentioned on several occasions, you know, continuing to provide their input as well, because they are they are our partners and they do have a stake in this as well. So, thanks. I completely agree. That I know that when we talk about no meat left on the bone, that's by design, because that's what we expect people to do is to is to um, be as efficient as possible with the money that we have, and so that that creates challenges now for sure because we're already kind of there. So we will see what happens. I also concur that uh, it's very important to get our, our, our units or our labor unions involved early in part of the process and let them feel welcome and heard because it's exactly what they are. So we're looking forward to that. Um, hopefully have some good discussions with them. Did you, one more thing, nothing? All right. Through the mayor. 
Oh, here we go. To the to the right. Yes, sir. <laughs> um, it's already been said multiple times, but uh, you know what we're faced with is something that this city hasn't probably ever seen with a pandemic that just totally stops the revenue stream, more or less. Um, and uh, over the next several months, really the next year, we've probably got some of the hardest decisions facing us that uh, any council setting up here has been through before with uh, so many things facing us with so many unknowns. Um, saying that, I want to convey to, to everyone out there that this isn't just numbers. Even though I'm a numbers guy and I'm already starting to look at things here, it's not just the numbers because I can run finances all day long, but at the end of the day, what I see when I look at all these numbers is I see over 300 families that work for the city of Yuba City. I also see about 69,000 residents that call Yuba City home. And it gets back to what the vice mayor had said. It deals with trying to come up with solutions, taking care of the people that are employed by the city and the quality of life here. So, um, ladies and gentlemen, we got a lot of work ahead of us, but know that we will go through this together. And it's not just about we're going to fight over one penny and we're going to do this or that. We really do care. I realize the impact this has. And um, we're going to have to take an eased in report, uh, approach, just like you said. The, um, you know, act, reevaluate, implement. Those are things I do every day in the financial world. We're always looking at the market, trying to figure out, okay, how do you adjust here? How do you adjust there? You have to be nimble. And that's what we're going to have to be over the next 12 months because September is going to be key. Next March and April is going to be key because all the provisions that's been there through this, um, those are our, our timelines. But saying all that, I'm actually quite optimistic. Uh, as I've talked with different people, I think getting to September is hopefully not going to be as bad as we're you know, being told because I'm talking to retail businesses, restaurants. They're seeing it come back strong. They're seeing, you know, the places being full. People are back out. I think people's had cabin fever. They got the stimulus checks. They don't care if they're buying a plant at one of the stores. They want to get out of the house. They want to do something. So we're starting to see that economic engine start to flow. I know we're an ag-based community. We're not tourism-based. And I know ag has been strong. And ag has continued to go on through this. So I'm really optimistic where we're going forward. But uh, just please know that at the end of the day, we're looking at numbers, but those numbers represent 300 families that work for the city and 69,000 people that call Yuba City home. Through the mayor, just a suggestion, because Diana said uh, do it lightly, and we got another week, and there'll be a few departments that really don't have to do a thing. Maybe have them give us a 1.5% scenario and just to see just get us a high and low here and something that they can get by and see if it's you know they'll be able to keep staffing and just maybe reduce their supplies or something but you they, you, you know she said don't take a big leap let's tread lightly maybe uh they can give us a bit one and a half percent scenario for next week you know, we, we have the two and a half in place taken a mere a mere one percent away from that the uh, the time that would take I think the with the department heads, once we give direction of a certain dollar amount, they can have the exercise their discretion and come back with our plan. We don't necessarily have to have that okay. in writing, but that, that hopefully that will be the case. Okay. Right? I'm hoping so. Yeah. All right. Thank you, Mayor. But thank you for the suggestion. I appreciate that. Does that make sense to you? Yeah. yeah. Okay. All right. All right. Thank you. All right. So we'll move on to, um, I already asked for public comment. I did. We've received no more. All right, thank you. 